Nowadays, many people are social media fanatics. They are always looking at their mobile phones or tablets and updating their Twitter or Facebook accounts. They are taking pictures of what they eat or taking pictures of themselves, which is called selfies. When people are not oversharing, they are constantly reading or looking at what friends and family members are posting. Social media is becoming addicting. Research shows that most people spend, on average, almost four hours a day on social networking sites. That's almost 30 hours a week. While some people need and use social media for work or to stay in touch with friends, other people find that using social media so much causes anxiety and stress. People also tend to use social media as a way to procrastinate. So, just as many religions ask people to abstain or not to have certain foods or drinks for a certain time, many people are taking social media fasts. They are not updating their statuses, and they are also not reading what other people are posting. They choose to stay away from social media for 30 days. Ironically, the details of these fasts can be found on social networking sites all over the internet. The reasons people undertake a fast are varied. Some people want to reconnect with their families or friends by disconnecting from their cell phones. Some people want to be more productive at work. What did some fasters do instead of logging on? Some decided to connect with friends by actually sitting down and having face-to-face -face conversations. If friends or loved ones were far away, they would call them on the telephone instead. Some even wrote handwritten postcards or letters. The results were mixed. Some people felt that not using social media made them more anxious. Others developed more positive habits, like journaling or meditating. The hockey team Los Angeles Kings won the 2014 Stanley Cup and had a parade last Monday in Los Angeles to celebrate the victory. During the parade, fans from all over California came out to support and celebrate with their favorite hockey team. According to the Los Angeles Police Department, over 200 uniformed officers were sent to the parade to make sure everything went okay. Although the parade went by without a problem, the LAPD's public information officer said that there was an increase in alcohol-related arrests than when the Kings won the Stanley Cup in 2012. According to Christopher Harris, who attended the parade with his family, a lot of people who attended the parade had gone to the bars surrounding the Staples Center and had gotten drunk before attending the parade. I saw one person throw up on the street in front of a policeman. They put him in the back of the police car, Harris said. The cheers from the crowd started getting louder and louder as the players from the Kings started passing by. Robert Lopez, who attended the parade even though he was rooting for the New York Rangers, said that the Kings fans started getting really annoying. He was pretty sure it was because of the alcohol. Everyone seemed pretty drunk. Lopez said that he was glad that he didn't bring his New York Rangers jersey as he originally planned on because he said people would have definitely thrown stuff at him. A public relations worker for Los Angeles Kings issued a statement for the hockey organization saying that they do not condone people to drink before going to attend the parade. He went on to say that they took the precaution of having the parade start earlier than it did in 2012 so that people didn't have a chance to go get a drink. It seems as if it still failed. Susan grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska, the heartland of the USA. 
She remembers playing in the cornfields as a child and seeing miles and miles of land stretching out as far as she could see. One day, her aunt took her to see the 1997 movie Titanic, starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet. She marveled at the sight of the vast ocean. It was something she had never seen before. She remembers turning to her aunt to say, I'm going on a ship like that one day, auntie. True to her words, Susan left Nebraska and moved to Los Angeles, California. She wanted to live near the ocean and was delighted to discover the Queen Mary was permanently docked in Long Beach. The grand ship, which has the same size of the Titanic, is now a museum and tourist attraction. She didn't hesitate to book a tour of the ship. This is wonderful, she thought to herself. Upon arriving on board, Susan was not disappointed. It was everything she hoped it would be. The ship was restored to its original state, which was very luxurious. The tour she took highlighted the ship's history and importance over the years. She ate at one of the three restaurants and stayed the night in the ship's hotel. The Queen Mary was built in the 1930s in Great Britain and enjoyed many years sailing across the Atlantic Ocean. It was host to many dignitaries such as Winston Churchill, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, and many Hollywood celebrities. During World War II, the ship was assigned as a troop transport where it was used to transport up to 18,000 Allied soldiers per trip. After the war, it was restored to its original state and began its transatlantic travels. In 1967, the city of Long Beach purchased the aging ocean liner, and it has been a popular attraction for the city ever since. It is living history, said Susan after her visit. Many young American boys and girls dream of becoming a rock star at one time or another in their lives. American culture is largely defined by the music young people enjoy. During the 1960s, music in the United States was greatly influenced by the social issues of the day. Many call the decade a revolutionary period in the country's history, and music was a big part of that revolution. When David was young, he was in love with the Beatles. The English band was possibly the most impactful group of the generation. It revolutionized music like no band or artist before them. Most young boys wanted to be Paul McCartney or John Lennon, the two founders of the band. Becoming rich and famous in America is one of the attractions of living in the U.S., and becoming a rock star is one way of achieving this. David knew this, so he got together with three of his friends and convinced them to form a band together. Many American rock and roll bands began their journey in someone's garage. One notable group to start this way was Van Halen. David and his friends were convinced they could become the next Beatles with a little luck and a lot of practice. The band practiced regularly over the years and soon became good enough to perform before some young audience, but they never hit the big time, unfortunately. The road to success in the music industry is not an easy one to travel, but that does not deter some American dreamers. David's philosophy was, you never know what the future holds, and is engaged in the music industry to this day. A couple of his original band members are also in the industry, enjoying marginal success, and are still pursuing their dream. Laura was confused. She came to the United States a year ago. She didn't understand the difference between Memorial Day and Veterans Day. She knew that both holidays had to do with remembering and honoring people who had fought in wars for the United States. She also knew that both days were national holidays. 
On both days, banks, schools, and the post offices were closed. On both holidays, stores offered special sales. On both holidays, people hung the American flag, and sometimes there were even fireworks. Laura had seen on television that on both days, the President of the United States made a speech and visited a cemetery, laying a wreath on the grave of a soldier. Laura decided to ask the mailman Brian what the difference was. She figured he would know since he had both days off from work. The next day, when Brian was dropping off Laura's mail, she asked him. Brian explained that Memorial Day is usually observed on the last Monday of May. This meant that it could be on a different date every year. Memorial Day is a day for remembering and honoring those in the military who died, especially if they died in a battle. Brian also told Laura that Memorial Day was also considered the unofficial start of summer. Many public beaches would open on Memorial Day. Veterans Day is a day set aside to thank and honor all people who served in the United States military. Brian explained that Veterans Day is also to remember those that are still alive. Brian told Laura that the date for Veterans Day never changes. It is always held on November 11, which was the date when World War I ended in 1918. Chris knew exactly where she was on January 28, 1986. As a matter of fact, nearly all Americans can recall what they were doing at the moment the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded. It is one of the most tragic moments in the history of the country, and it is one that will not be forgotten. Chris was working as a clerk at a clothing manufacturing plant in Commerce, California, which is about three miles from downtown Los Angeles. On that morning, she was filing some documents when one of her coworkers came through the door into a large work area that contained about 20 employees. The shuttle just blew up, he shouted. Most employees were taken aback. They had no idea what he was talking about. Once again, he blurted out, the space shuttle just blew up in Florida. Chris knew at that time something went very wrong. The space shuttle program began in the early 80s and continued to this day. The fleet consists of various shuttles that are designed to go into space, establish an orbit, and do a variety of tasks. It was heralded as a new era in space exploration. In the past, space exploration vehicles were used once and then discarded. The shuttle program revolutionized the way space travel was done. Chris couldn't believe her ears. Soon, almost all employees huddled around the lunchroom TV set, watching in horror the events taking place. It was a sad day for the United States, but it was also the beginning of a new era in space travel. The country rebounded from this disaster and restarted its program after a couple of years. There have been other accidents in the program, and most notably the Columbia, which disintegrated upon re-entry in February 2003. But the U.S. will not be deterred. Space travel is dangerous, but the spirit of the American people will not be contained. There was a march through the Boyle Heights neighborhood of Los Angeles. The march was sponsored by a coalition of local organizations and agencies. The purpose of the march was to bring awareness to the violence in the community. Many people have been killed because of gun violence and other crimes. The march began at 9 a.m. on a busy corner. Many parents brought their children to the march. The crowd began to walk down the neighborhood sidewalks. Occasionally, the crowd would stop, and an organizer using a bullhorn would tell the story of a person who was killed. 
After the organizer told the story, there would be a prayer followed by a moment of silence. There were relatives of people who had been killed participating in the march. Some of these relatives would leave lit candles, balloons, or flowers in remembrance of the persons who died. One woman who died was found in the lake of Hollenbeck Park. Police suspect that her boyfriend killed her. She had a baby daughter. Her ex-husband participated in the march and asked that organizers include her in their prayers. The march continued for 20 blocks and ended at Wabash Park. While the march was somber, the mood inside the park was more celebratory. Different organizations had booths with information about local programs. There was a craft table for kids to draw a picture about the kind of neighborhood they wanted to live in. Different bands played between speakers, offering solutions to the neighborhood's problems. On the same day, there was another march at a nearby housing project. In the spring, four houses were firebombed. Police suspect the attacks were racially motivated. Organizers planned to hold the march again next year. They really hoped, though, that conditions in the neighborhood would improve so they wouldn't have to march. David's cell phone started vibrating in the middle of the night. He woke up right away and nervously reached to his nightstand. He always set his cell phone to vibrate and charged it next to his bed when he went to sleep. David looked at the time on his cell phone. It was two in the morning. The only time someone contacted him at that hour was when there was an emergency. He read the message on his cell phone. It was an emergency. The text message said that a little boy had been kidnapped near where David lived. The boy had been taken into an orange Honda Civic. The text message also gave the license plate number of the car. There was also a picture of the little boy and a written description of what the boy was wearing when he was kidnapped. The boy's name was Adam. David didn't feel like he could do anything at 2 o'clock in the morning. He went back to sleep. In the morning, however, he woke up thinking about the message and about the boy. David had never heard about an Amber Alert before. He decided to look it up on his computer. He learned that the Amber Alert system is an emergency broadcast system used to let people know when a child is abducted. It was named for a little girl named Amber Hagerman who was kidnapped when riding her bike in Texas. Little Amber was found dead later. The news made David feel sad and angry, but he also felt like now he could do something to help. He decided to stay aware to see if he saw a boy or a car matching the description in the Amber Alert. Ken and Anthony were childhood friends. They went to elementary and high school together. They went to college in different states, and then they lost touch. That was 20 years ago. One morning, Ken was reading the newspaper with his morning coffee. Inside, he saw an announcement for a poetry reading at a nearby bookstore. He was surprised to find that the featured poet was none other than his friend Anthony. Ken decided to see what his old pal was up to. Ken sat in the last row of the area set up inside the bookstore. When Anthony was introduced and came up to the podium, Ken hardly recognized him. Anthony was almost completely bald and had a little pot belly. When Anthony was in high school, he was very handsome. What Anthony had lost in looks was made up for in talent. Anthony's poetry was quite good. Anthony recognized Ken sitting in the back row. When the reading was over, Ken stood in line with the others, waiting for Anthony to sign a copy of his book. When it was Ken's turn, Anthony stood up and hugged his long-lost friend. 
Anthony invited Ken to stay until he had finished signing books. Ken did, and the two men grabbed a cup of coffee at a nearby cafe. Even though so many years had passed since the two had seen each other, both men had a lot in common. Both graduated from college with degrees in comparative literature. Both went to graduate school. Anthony got his Master's of Fine Art in Writing. Ken went to law school. Both men married Mexican women. Both men divorced. Both men also had sons that were only a year apart. Ken and Anthony decided not to lose touch again. They planned to meet once a month for breakfast on Saturdays. A great American tradition dating back to the birth of the country is the board game night. This is where two or more families get together at someone's home to have dinner and refreshments and then play games. This is an activity where almost anyone can play. Most board games can be played by children as young as six or seven years old. It is fun for the kids to test their skills against their older brothers and sisters or their parents. One of the oldest and most popular board games is Monopoly. It is a game where all players start in the same place and roll dice to advance from square to square. Little Johnny wanted to join the game one night and asked his parents if he could play. Please, Mommy, please let me play with you tonight, he pleaded. His mom thought about it for a while and said, Okay, Johnny, tonight you can play. She really didn't think he was going to be able to play the game, but to her surprise, he was very good at it. The object of the game is to bankrupt your opponents and have most money at the end of the game. You buy properties with money collected by moving around the board. The more money you have in your bank, the more property you can buy. Johnny landed on the boardwalk square, which is a very prized property. It is the most expensive property, but Johnny knew its value and bought it. The square is positioned at the end of the game where everyone collects $200, but if you land on it, you have to pay a high rent. Johnny bought a couple of nearby properties, too, and before long, he was collecting rent from all the other players. Johnny ended up winning the game, which made him very happy, and it also made his mom very proud of him. Johnny showed her and everyone else what he was capable of. The Mexican national soccer team had just won a match against Croatia in the World Cup. This meant that Mexico advanced to the next round. Mexican soccer fans worldwide are known for loyalty to their team. After this win, however, some wonder if they took their loyalty too far. In Huntington Park, California, fans took to the street after the win. The afternoon crowd grew to almost 200 people. The fans waved flags, yelled, honked their cars, and jumped around the streets. The crowd was so big that they blocked traffic. This caused traffic jams in the area. While most of these fans were just overzealous, a handful were intoxicated. Instead of just celebrating, they began throwing bottles. Some of the fans even began rocking cars parked on the streets. Police were called to the scene. Not only did the local police department send in patrol cars, two police helicopters flew overhead and some police on horseback began to try to disperse the crowd. Someone threw a bottle at a police horse. Police urged shop owners to close their businesses. The police arrested five people. Thankfully, no one was hurt. When Mexico played again the following week, Police patrolled the streets in advance. This time, they were going to be prepared if Mexico won again. Mexico was playing against the Netherlands. The Dutch team won 2-1. to one. Mexican fans in Huntington Park still took to the streets despite the loss. This time, the police were waiting in riot gear. 
The fans waved flags, chanted, honked horns, rocked cars, and even lit firecrackers, but no one threw bottles. The police didn't arrest anyone. They did have to close off three blocks to traffic, though. The police were probably secretly glad that Mexico didn't win. In four years, when the next World Cup happens, they'll worry about it again. Carla moved to San Francisco two years ago. All of her family was in Boston. Every year, she tried to visit her family twice. She would go once in the summer and once during the Christmas holiday. Traveling cross country was expensive, though. She needed to find a way to save money on her travel. She decided to try and use an airline loyalty program to see if that would help. There was one airline that Carla preferred to travel on. Every time she used that airline, there were hardly any delays, and the trip was always comfortable. The airline featured in seat direct TV so she could watch her favorite television shows while traveling. She could also order food and beverages right from her seat. An extra perk was that each seat had an electric outlet. This made it easy for Carla to plug in her computer and do work on her trip. On her last trip, Carla decided to sign up for that airline's loyalty program. She would earn points for every trip she made. Those points could be used towards air travel. The airline worker informed Carla that she could earn even more points if she signed up for the airline sponsored credit card. The card had a low interest rate and no annual fee. For every dollar Carla spent, she would earn one point to use towards travel. Carla signed up for the credit card. She had good credit, so she was approved. Carla used that credit card to pay for a round trip ticket to Boston. After only one trip, Carla had earned enough points for a free one way ticket. That saved her almost $500. It felt like traveling for free. Carla decided to stay loyal to this airline. Marie and Mark have been dating for four months. The relationship is moving fast. They already are talking about a future together, including moving in together. For Marie, this means moving her two children from a previous marriage as well. Marie's children call Mark daddy. Mark and Marie see each other almost every day, and yet they have never actually met. Marie lives in the city of Terrace, and Mark lives in Houston. They began conversing with each other in an online chat room. How they see each other is through video chat programs like Skype. They are constantly texting one another and sending one another pictures. Marie asks her friend Bella for advice. Bella met her husband, Dan, on Twitter four years ago and moved from New York City to Los Angeles to be with him. It was different from Marie and Mark's situation, though. Bella and Dan had friends in common, even though they lived on opposite coasts of the United States. Bella also traveled to Los Angeles a number of times to decide if she really liked Dan and if she could live in another city. Dan and Bella traveled back and forth for over a year before deciding to move in with one another and make a life together. Bella, like Marie, has two children from a previous marriage. Bella's kids do not call Dan daddy, though. Bella warns Marie not to get in too deep. She tells Marie that Mark needs to come and visit Los Angeles. Marie can also go to Houston. Bella feels that you really cannot be in a relationship with someone you only know through the computer. There have even been cases of people being tricked and not being who they say they are. Marie is infatuated, though. She and Mark have started talking about the kind of house they will buy together in Houston. It was the first week of June. Gabby just finished her third year of high school in El Sereno. However, when she received her report card in the mail, she learned that she failed a semester of algebra. This meant she had to go to summer school. 
Gabby was glad she had the chance to make up the class. She can't move on to the next level in math if she doesn't pass algebra. Summer school isn't easy, though. Gabby has to master the material in six weeks instead of the 20 she had during the regular school year. Summer school also meant that Gabby would be stuck in a hot classroom while most of her friends were at the beach or local amusement parks. Her friends passed algebra, so they had most of June, July, and August free from schoolwork. Going to summer school also meant that Gabby's family had to change their summer vacation plans. Gabby had to be in summer school from 9 a.m. to noon. She couldn't stay up late on weeknights or sleep in. She had to be on the bus at least an hour before class started or else she would be late. The classrooms were hot since the school building was old and did not have air conditioning. When Gabby came home from school, she couldn't do whatever she wanted. After Gabby took the bus home from school, she had homework to do. This was the first time Gabby had to go to summer school. She wanted it to be the last time. Gabby made a promise to herself. In the fall, when regular classes begin again, she will try her hardest to pass. Sweating in a classroom while your friends are out having a good time is not fun. Summer break is not so much of a break when you have school. Francesca picked up her seven-year-old son from school one afternoon. Isaac proudly showed his mother what he had made at school that day. It was a card made out of brightly colored construction paper. It's for Father's Day, Isaac explained. The card was cut into the shape of a man's dress shirt with a drawing of a man's dress tie. Inside the card, Isaac had written the words, Happy Father's Day. Francesca wasn't familiar with Father's Day as it wasn't something celebrated in her home country. So she asked her neighbor, Jenny, about it. Jenny told her that Father's Day, like Mother's Day, is a made-up holiday in the United States. It is always celebrated on the second Sunday in June. People give fathers cards, presents, go out to eat at a restaurant, or do something special that day. It's a day to show gratitude to your father, Jenny explained. Francesca understood, but she also felt a little bad. While the Father's Day card Isaac made was nice, Isaac's father never wore a dress shirt or a tie. Isaac's father, Tim, wore a uniform to work. On his days off, he liked to dress casually and comfortably. The most dressed up he got was by wearing a polo shirt. Francesca had an idea. She went shopping the day before Father's Day to get her husband a surprise. On Father's Day morning, she and Isaac gave Tim a box wrapped up in nice paper. Happy Father's Day, Francesca and Tim shouted. When Tim unwrapped the box, he laughed. Inside the box was the Father's Day card Isaac made in school. Also inside the box were a dress shirt and a tie. They were the same color as the card Isaac made. Tim, Francesca, and Isaac went next door to Jenny's house for a barbecue. Tim wore the dress shirt and tie. It was the morning after Julia's first Thanksgiving in the United States. The night before, she had a huge dinner with her friend Elizabeth's family. Before eating roast turkey, sweet potatoes, and cranberry sauce, each person at the table had to say something they were grateful for. Julia appreciated that she was able to participate in this holiday that recalls the pilgrims' first harvest after arriving from England a long time ago. Julia's phone rang at four in the morning. It was Elizabeth. Elizabeth invited Julia to go shopping with her. We are going to the stores so early, Julia asked sleepily. Elizabeth explained that the day after Thanksgiving in the United States was called Black Friday. Stores, which held special sales, started very early. It's the official start of the holiday shopping season, Elizabeth explained. Julia and Elizabeth were outside the local shopping center by five in the morning. 
Julia was surprised to see that not only were all the stores open, but they were crowded. Elizabeth told Julia that this was nothing. Some people camped outside the mall all night so that they could be among the first to enter and get extra special deals called doorbusters. Many times these doorbusters were electronic items at extremely reduced prices. Often only a small number of these items are made available. Sometimes they are only available to the first 100 people in line. Julia thought it sounded violent and wondered aloud if people really broke down doors to get into the store. Sometimes there is a lot of pushing, Elizabeth explained. Some people have even been hurt or killed because of physical fights over limited products. At 5 a.m., though, the doorbusters were gone and the cash registers had long lines. Many shoppers had full shopping carts of presents they intended to give away for Christmas, Hanukkah, or Kwanzaa. Ken received many reminders in the mail in the weeks leading up to the first Tuesday in November, Election Day. From before the time he became a United States citizen, he looked forward to being able to choose who would represent him in the various levels of government. Shortly after taking the citizenship oath, Ken filled out a short paper form registering him to vote and choosing a political party affiliation. Ken appreciated that choosing a specific political party didn't limit whom he could vote for, though. He was free to vote for someone of the party he registered under. He could even vote for someone of a different party. Since his vote was secret, no one would know anyway. Now that he was a naturalized citizen, Ken spent many hours looking over the various voter guides that appeared in his mailbox. On the national level, Ken could vote for president, members of the Congress. On the state level, Ken could vote for state Congress people and governor of the state. Locally, Ken could cast a vote for mayor, city council persons, and local school board members. He felt a little overwhelmed by the choices. Besides getting mail about the various candidates, he saw many commercials featuring each candidate's position on various issues. There were also televised debate, which helped show what the candidates have in common and how they differ. Ken was nervous on the day he went to vote. He went to his local polling place. A poll worker asked for Ken's name and address to verify he was registered. Ken confirmed his registration by signing next to his name. Then he was given a ballot and led to a booth where he had to make some tough choices. Callie noticed that her son Jesus, a high school senior, was acting very strangely. He seemed to be hoarding his allowance and having many whispery conversations with his friends. When Kelly asked Jesus about it, he admitted that he was nervous about prom, a dance held at the end of senior year of high school for those graduating. Jesus was feeling a lot of pressure to ask a girl to be his date for the prom. Girls like Lexi were also feeling pressure about a guy they liked asking to the prom. A photographer would be on hand to capture on film forever who said yes. Then there was the matter of the clothes. Young men like Jesus didn't have to worry so much. Most of them would just rent tuxedos. Young women like Lexi, however, had to make sure that whatever dress they wore would be unique. There is nothing more embarrassing than going to the prom and having another girl wearing the same dress. For the parents, like Callie, one of the biggest stressors was money. Tickets to the prom cost $120 per student. Renting tuxedos costs a lot of money, not to mention the fact that traditionally he had to buy his date a corsage. Most students split the cost of a limousine among friends. Callie had more than money on her mind, though. She had heard stories about wild things happening on prom night. She worried about Jesus drinking alcohol, 
even though he was underage. Callie encouraged her son not to worry so much about finding a date. Maybe he could go to prom with a group of friends. That was what Jesus ended up doing. It was fine until it was time to be photographed. All of Jesus' friends split up into couples. Jesus posed alone. Meryl was a little embarrassed to admit it. She was 37 years old and didn't know how to drive. When she lived in Queens, it wasn't such a big deal. Everything that she needed was close by. The supermarket was one block away. She would take her shopping cart and get what she needed for the week easily. When she didn't feel like dragging the shopping cart, the supermarket even delivered for free. All she had to do was tip the driver. She would use that same shopping cart to take clothes to and from the laundromat, which was only a block away. While Merrill's job was not a block away, the subway station was. Every day she would walk the block to catch a 45-minute underground train ride to work. She repeated the journey in reverse to return home in the evenings. Alhambra sure was different, though. The walk from Merrill's house to the supermarket was nearly a mile. She didn't feel like walking that long a distance while pushing a shopping cart full of a week's worth of food. The laundromat was a mile in the other direction. She wasn't going to push her dirty clothes through that many streets. There were no trains nearby to take her to work, just buses. The buses always took a long time to come. For the first few weeks, Merrill was always late everywhere. Sometimes when she had an urgent appointment, Meryl would ask friends to give her a ride somewhere. Almost all of her friends had cars and knew how to drive. Most of them learned it when they were in high school. After a while, her friends were tired of giving Meryl rides everywhere. You need to learn how to drive, Meryl, they told her. She knew they were right, but Meryl was scared. Emma's son Johnny had been bugging her about joining a sports team like all his friends. One day she took Johnny to the local recreational center where they were having tryouts for baseball. She found out about the tryouts from a banner she saw hanging outside the recreation center when she was driving by. Baseball seemed like the perfect sport for Johnny to learn to play since it is nicknamed America's pastime. Emma took her son to the tryouts after school. I'm sorry, one of the coaches told Emma. Johnny was too young to try out for baseball. Since he was six years old, he could try out for t-ball, though. T-ball is similar to baseball, except that there is no pitcher. Instead, the ball is placed on a stand called a tee because of its shape. This makes it easier for younger kids to hit. T-ball games are also shorter than regular baseball games. Regular baseball games last nine innings. Emma couldn't imagine her son standing still for nine minutes. T-ball sounded like a good way to introduce her son to the responsibilities of being on a sports team and the rules of baseball. Emma had to bring Johnny back on a different day to try out for T-ball. When she did, he was put on a team. After paying a fee, Johnny was given a uniform. Johnny looked at the back of his uniform. Hey, look, Mom, I'm number one, he said proudly. Once Johnny started playing, though, it was clear to Emma that he was not very good at baseball. He stuck with it, though, and his team ended the season in fourth place. There were only four teams in the T-ball league. Can I play again next season? Johnny asked his mom. Yes, but see if you can get another number, she told him. Sam was so proud of himself. He had gone two years without smoking a cigarette. At the age of 14, Sam was already puffing away on his favorite brand of cigarettes, Marlboro. Even though people have to be over the age of 18 in America to buy cigarettes, Sam knew of a few stores that sold cigarettes without checking identification. 
Sam had spent seven years smoking. He was 21 when he decided to quit. Sam decided to quit after discovering he had been coughing blood. He would get tired quickly, and he noticed his teeth were getting really yellow. Whenever Sam would hang out with his friends that smoked, he would always want a cigarette really badly, but was always strong and said no when they offered him one. Before Sam quit, he would go through a pack of cigarettes a week. The pack of cigarettes usually cost him $5.25. As a way to encourage himself to stop smoking, Sam decided to save his money every week. After two years, Sam took out all his money he had saved from not smoking and saw that he had saved $504. He decided to buy a bicycle so he could ride it for fun and for exercise. As he started riding his bike more frequently, he noticed that he didn't think about smoking anymore. He didn't want a cigarette when he would hang out with his friends that smoked. Sam would ride his bike in the morning because he loved getting a breath of fresh air. In the past, when he smoked, the only time he got a breath of fresh air was when he went out for a cigarette. He enjoyed being outside, breathing in the air that would hit his face as he rode his bike through the town. Music had always played a big role in Jonathan's life. He liked different types of music, from hip-hop to rock and roll. One of his favorite bands was the Beatles. He could hear them every day. Jonathan didn't feel that way towards any other band. He had all of their albums, and he knew all the lyrics to their songs. One day, Jonathan and his girlfriend Sarah went for a ride in Jonathan's car. Sarah was excited to show Jonathan a new band she had heard about. Sarah brought the CD and played it for Jonathan as they drove around town. The first song was called 40 Day Dream, and the band's name was Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros. Jonathan didn't think much of them at first, maybe because he was driving, but after they stopped driving, he had the song stuck in his head. Jonathan decided to look for their albums. They had three out, so Jonathan decided to buy them all. During a rainy day, Jonathan invited Sarah to his house, and they listened to all three of their albums. Jonathan loved the band. He loved how they sounded like bands from the past. He loved how they reminded him of the Beatles. When he and Sarah were listening to the third album, the song If I Were Free came on. Jonathan jumped off his bed and started dancing alone. Sarah looked at him, smiled, and laughed. Jonathan started clapping, and then he started singing. The light became too heavy, and I fell into a dream, he sang. He fell next to Sarah, looked at her, and said, I feel like I'm in a dream when I listen to this band. Thank you for introducing me to them. The night was calm in Los Angeles, although the wind was particularly chilly. Frank had gotten out of work in downtown Los Angeles around 11 p.m. He got his sweater, put his headphones on to listen to music, and put his backpack on. Frank liked taking his backpack to work because he could take a change of clothes to work so that he didn't have to wear his uniform after he got out. In order to get to his house, Frank had to take a bus and a train, 
but he didn't mind because he could listen to music. After getting off the train, Frank got something to eat at a little restaurant that stayed open late and served hamburgers. After eating, Frank still had to walk for 30 minutes. While Frank was walking through a small street with a lot of homes, he noticed there was a car behind him following him slowly. He looked back and noticed it was a police car. He didn't mind because he wasn't doing anything illegal, so he kept walking. As Frank was about to get home, the police car turned on the lights and drove directly to where Frank was at. They stopped and got out of the car. The two police officers surrounded Frank. Frank was used to this and put his hands in the air. The police officers told him to put his hands on the hood, which he did. As Frank was being searched, he asked the police officers why he was being searched. They ignored him and asked him questions. Do you have anything illegal on you? Have you been arrested before? Do you have a weapon? Frank answered no to all of their questions. They put Frank in the back of the police car. Frank asked again why he was being searched. One officer said, because you are walking around the neighborhood with a hooded sweatshirt. Frank had done nothing wrong, so the police let him go after searching his backpack. Jacqueline and her family were sleeping in their home. Their dog Scruffy was asleep next to Jacqueline. It was 4.36 a.m. and the night was quiet. There were no cars passing in the street. No noise could be heard. It was like everything was still. Jacqueline always put a cup with water next to her bed so that if she got thirsty during the night, she didn't have to walk all the way to the kitchen. That was when it happened. The furniture started shaking and the cup of water fell to the floor. Scruffy started barking and it woke up Jacqueline. She looked around and saw that all her stuff was shaking. She started screaming. Soon after, her father came in and told her to come out quick. It was an earthquake. Jacqueline was so scared and couldn't move. Her father went in and picked her up. He took her outside where Jacqueline's mother and brother were at already. Jacqueline and her brother were crying. They didn't understand what was happening. Luckily, Jacqueline's mother had prepared an emergency kit and had it outside. She looked for the key, which was hidden inside a fake rock, and unlocked the box. She pulled out blankets to keep her children warm. Jacqueline looked at her mother and took the blanket. She then saw her dad take a flashlight from the box. He used the flashlight to see if the house had any damage. The father knew the house was not safe, so they stayed up until someone could examine the house. The children didn't have school due to the earthquake, so they spent the day with their parents. Jacqueline was so proud of her parents because they knew what to do during this disaster. She talked to her friends and they weren't so lucky. Jacqueline went up to her mother and father and hugged them because she knew she felt the protection of her parents. Albert had been playing the guitar almost all his life. His first guitar was given to him by his father. It was a Fender Stratocaster, and Albert absolutely loved it. As a young boy, 
Albert would spend hours and hours listening to songs, trying to learn them on his guitar. As he grew older, he didn't play the guitar as much. He met a girl and they started dating. Eventually, they had a son. Every once in a while, Albert would take out the old Fender Stratocaster and play a song for his baby son named Max. He loved playing guitar for Max because it would calm him down when he started crying. As Max got older, he started listening to the same kind of music his father listened to. Albert and his son would listen to music together and talk about what they thought the songs meant. During Max's 10th birthday, Albert gave his son a Fender Stratocaster as well, the same model his father had gotten him. It cost him a bit more, but he wanted his son to have the same one as his. Max was happy. He asked his dad to teach him all the songs he knew. Albert smiled and said, of course. When Max turned 17, he joined a band. They played local shows and were able to record some songs by themselves. One day, as Max was walking home from band practice, someone stopped him and took away his guitar. He was devastated. He went home and locked himself in his room. He couldn't face his dad. He knew he had let him down. When it was time for dinner, Max opened his bedroom door and saw his dad's Fender Stratocaster on the guitar stand. There was a letter and a set of keys on the guitar. The letter said, To my guitar hero, Max, here is my guitar. You need it more than I do. And the key to your new car, so nothing like this will happen to you again. A school bus transporting Maxwell High School students overturned on the corner of Seeley Street and Wilton Avenue. The driver of the bus was trying to avoid hitting a car that passed a red light, and the bus overturned with 37 students inside. The driver suffered minor injuries to the face, and two students broke their arms. Roger Peterson, principal of Maxwell High School, said that the driver was not at fault. His reaction helped prevent any serious injuries. As soon as the bus overturned, the driver opened the door using the emergency handle and started evacuating the students one by one. He notified the police of the students that were injured. We teach our drivers to ensure the safety of the students first, Peterson said. The driver, whose name is not being released at the moment due to an investigation, along with the two students, are being treated at Belmont Hospital. The parents were notified as soon as possible by school officials. According to John Pineda, who witnessed the accident, the school bus almost hit the car. The bus wasn't going that fast, but the other car was. If the bus had hit the car, those people inside would surely have been seriously injured or worse, Pineda said. Pineda also said that the driver of the school bus took precaution to turn where people weren't walking. If he were to have made a right rather than a left, he would have definitely hit people that were crossing the street. Peterson issued a statement saying that the students who were inside the bus could miss school the next day to make sure they were okay and relax with their family. According to Peterson, 
the police provided him with a list of students that were involved in the accident. Police are looking for the driver of the car that passed the red light. It was a white Honda Civic. Anthony was a senior at high school and had a car. Even though Anthony wasn't 21, which is the legal age to buy alcohol, he would occasionally have a drink with his friends. Anthony was excited because today was his prom day. He had his tuxedo on and had a flower for his date. He got into his car and went to pick up his friend Jacob and then to pick up Jennifer, his date. When they showed up to the prom, Jacob's date and Jennifer went to the restroom. Jacob took out a small bottle of whiskey from his jacket pocket and told Anthony to take a drink. Anthony took some and didn't like it, but he still drank. As Anthony and Jennifer danced, he began to feel dizzy. He was drunk. Anthony, are you okay? Jennifer asked. Anthony looked at her and laughed. She figured out that he was drunk and decided to leave with Jacob's date. Anthony got mad and decided to leave. He got in his car and left. As he was driving down Mental Avenue, he saw a police car following him. He got nervous and started chewing gum. Anthony was looking at the police car through his mirror so much that he almost took a red light. When the police saw this, he stopped Anthony. The police gave him a few tests to see if he had been drinking, and Anthony failed them. The police took him away. His father picked him up, and they went to talk to a lawyer. The lawyer said that Anthony would have to take alcohol education classes, go to Alcoholics Anonymous, do community service, and pay a fine. Anthony's father said that Anthony would have to get a job as well to pay for the fine. Anthony decided never to drink after that. He said that it wasn't worth it. Claudette's dad didn't let her have a boyfriend. He told her that 12-year-olds aren't supposed to have boyfriends. Claudette always wanted a boyfriend but didn't want to get her dad mad. She would always go to the library after school to study and wait for her dad to pick her up. One day, a boy named Stephen decided to go up to Claudette and say hi. Hello, my name is Stephen. I've seen you here before, he said. Oh, hello, my name is Claudette. I always come here to study and wait for my dad. I live a bit far, she said. Stephen asked Claudette if he could sit with her so he didn't have to study alone. Claudette said yes. They started studying and started talking. Soon they weren't studying at all. They began talking about music, books, movies, and what they liked to do for fun. Stephen had to leave before Claudette's dad came to pick her up, and he asked her if she would be back tomorrow so that they could study together again. Claudette said yes. The next day, Stephen showed up and saw Claudette. He sat down, and she smiled at him and said hello. They began talking about their classes and what they were learning at school. After they talked for an hour, Claudette told him she had to go look for a book and if he could go with her. Stephen agreed and went to look for the book with Claudette. As they were looking for the book, Claudette was in one aisle and Stephen was in another. 
Claudette took out a book and saw Stephen was looking at her. She smiled, and he told her she was beautiful. She was happy he said that, because she really liked him. Claudette asked him if he wanted to be her boyfriend. Stephen said yes. As they were hugging, Claudette's dad came in and saw them. He split them up and took Claudette by the hand. He told Stephen that he wouldn't be able to see her again. Stephen was sad. My big brother James has always been a good baseball player. He is six years older than me, but he always invites me to go play catch with him. It's one of my favorite things to do. We live next to a park. Whenever we get bored, we just cross the street and start throwing the ball around. The last time we went to the park, we were playing catch and also hitting some baseballs with our bats. Some guys came up to us because they wanted to play a game of baseball. They needed two more players, so they asked us to play with them. James asked me if I wanted to play, and I said yes. The guy's name was Christian, and he introduced us to all the guys. James introduced me and gave the guy our names. I asked Christian if I could play catcher. I always liked playing catcher at school. He said that I could, and James got first base. During the game, James got a home run, and I was excited for him. I got on the base twice, but I got out all the time. I was sad, but James told me not to worry and that it happens. After the game, Christian and the guys told James if he wanted to go grab a drink with them. I thought James was going to go because he likes to drink, but he told them that he was going to take me out to eat. We thanked them for the game, and Christian asked James for his phone number, just in case they ever needed more players for a game. James gave it to him, and then we went to go eat at Jim's Burgers. I asked James why he didn't go to drink with the guys. He told me that he knew his responsibilities. I didn't know what he meant, but I was glad he didn't go. Now we could eat burgers and fries. George had always been a funny guy. I met him at the movie theater. I went to see the new Spider-Man movie, and he was there dressed up like Spider-Man. He was acting like Spider-Man, and everyone was clapping for him and asking him for pictures. My girlfriend wanted to go take her picture with him, and I said, okay. When I went up to him, I asked him if it was okay to take a picture of him and my girlfriend. He said yes. I took the picture and started talking to him. He told me that his friends hadn't showed up yet and that he didn't want to sit alone. My girlfriend and I decided to sit with him. After we saw the movie, I asked him if he wanted to go grab a bite to eat. He accepted my invitation. He had me and my girlfriend laughing the whole drive to the restaurant. We talked a lot on the phone. We were big fans of Nintendo games. I invited him over to my house so we could play. George never had a bad thing to say about anyone. He told me once that there is good in everyone. Some are just afraid to show it. George had invited me to his house one day to play old Nintendo games, but when I showed up to his house, no one was there. I looked around and called him on his cell phone, but no one answered. I decided to leave and come back in an hour. 
when I got back to George's house, I saw that someone was inside. I knocked on the door, and an older woman came out. It was George's aunt. I asked her if George was home. She looked at me with sad eyes and said that George was in the hospital. I finally understood why George was the way he was. George had cancer, and the doctors told him that he could go at any time. That's why George was always looking for the humor in life, because his real life was filled with sadness. I had the most wonderful childhood. I grew up in San Diego, where it rains about two days a year, and it's always sunny and bright. I could ride my bike just about any day of the year and had lots of friends. My best friend was George Kenny. George lived just a few houses down the block from me, and we were the same age. Actually, I was about 28 days older than him, a fact that I always threw in his face. You must respect your elders, I would sometimes tell him. That usually got a nasty response from him. Anyway, George came up to me one day and said, Hey Richard, why don't we form a bicycle club? I thought about it for a while, and then he said we could give ourselves a cool name and get hats and stickers and have lots of fun. What do you say? I immediately fell in love with the idea. You bet. Georgie Porgy. I used to call him that all the time, even though I knew he hated it. Well, before we knew it, we got a couple of other guys together and came up with the best name for a club ever. We were the White Skulls. Why we chose that name, I'll never know, but all the kids seemed to like it, so I was okay with it too. The four of us went to the local bike shop, and we each picked out a school decal to put on our bikes. I chose a green one, while Georgie Porgy picked red. He shouted, I am the red skull. I am the king of the club. If you don't like it, try to take it from me. George was a pretty big guy so no one argued with him. We rode our bikes everywhere and had a great summer. That's how we formed the greatest bike club ever. Alex was shopping at the local market yesterday, trying to find some fresh vegetables for his dinner that night. The market is in the neighborhood and it is not one of the giant national big-name stores. It is a small store with only a few locations around Los Angeles. Alex likes these types of markets so much better than the superstores because there are real people running them. Alex knows the guy that runs the fruits and vegetables section at the market. His name is Diego, who was born in Tijuana, Mexico, about 120 miles from Los Angeles. Diego always lets Alex know what is a good buy at the market. Hola, Diego, Alex said in Spanish. Hey, Alex, how are you? He answered in English. This happens every time Alex talks to Diego. Alex speaks to him in Spanish, and Diego answers in English. Spanish is spoken a lot around L.A. The city has the largest population of Mexicans anywhere in the world, except Mexico City. Alex likes to show Diego how much Spanish he knows, and Diego 
also wanted Alex to know how much English he knows. It's so funny to hear a conversation like this. They sometimes get strange looks from people. Today, Diego got some beautiful oranges. They were big and plump and were at the right price, too. These are great, Alex. You will like them very much, said Diego. Alex responded with, Muy bueno, Diego, which means very good, Diego. He also told Alex about some tasty cucumbers they had today, and Alex ended up buying a few of those, too. When Alex left, he said, Buenos tardes, Diego, which is a Mexican farewell phrase. And Diego said, See you soon, my friend. Dennis had always been a terrible student. When he was a kid, his parents sent him to a Catholic school. He didn't know much about the school. Of course, he didn't know much about anything when he was six years old, but he did know one thing. All his friends from the neighborhood went to a public school. Dennis was the only boy that went to a private school, and his friends would often tease him about it. You're not one of us. You're not one of us, they would sometimes chant. He wasn't really alone, though. His friend Patricia also went to the Catholic school, but she was a girl. After a while, they began walking to the small school together every morning. Pat was the first girlfriend Dennis had ever had. She wasn't his girlfriend. She was just a friend who happened to be a girl. The nuns at the school were very mean. They ruled the school like it was a prison. Dennis was afraid to even raise his hand to ask a question. His mother was often called into meetings with the principal about Dennis, who would also sit in the office listening to the principal telling his mother how smart he was but was very lazy. Needless to say, Dennis didn't do well in school and ended up going to a junior college after high school. He didn't do very well there either and soon dropped out. That all changed after Dennis grew up and started working. He had worked for many years before deciding he wanted to earn a degree after all. Dennis went back to school at the age of 30 and soon was a college graduate with a degree. It turned out Dennis wasn't as lazy as those nuns thought he was. Phil grew up in a very poor family in a very poor town. It was pretty bad. Sometimes Phil and his sisters didn't have enough to eat and went to bed hungry. That was okay with Phil, though, because that was his life, and he thought it was just the way everybody in the world lived. Phil had a lot of fun and had many friends. It wasn't until Phil was about 12 years old that he began to realize that there were better things out there in the world. Phil and his best friend Albert would sit around and talk about getting out of this place to see the world. It was a fantasy, but it was a good fantasy. They really didn't know how they would do it, but they had a dream. Then one day, Phil's cousin Ralphie came to visit. Phil didn't know Ralphie very well. Ralphie grew up in Texas and was about eight years older than Phil. 
It had been years since Phil saw his cousin. That day, Ralphie changed Phil's life. Ralphie walked into the house wearing his Marine Corps uniform, and Phil knew at that moment that he wanted to become a Marine. Phil and Ralphie talked all night long. Ralphie told him all about the Corps, and Phil was fascinated. Ralphie was wearing his medals and awards, and his uniform was so neat and clean that Phil wanted to join at that moment. Five years later, Phil enlisted in the Marines. He was 17 and needed his mom's permission. His mom said, where do I sign? Of course, she was joking, but she knew Phil was going to do this. It was his way out of this place, so she gave him her blessings. The day Phil left, he promised his mom he would be back. He kept his promise. He came back several times over the years and helped his family as much as he could. David must have been the only kid in America that did not like summer vacation. Every year between the beginning of June through the end of August, school kids were on vacation. Only to David, summer vacation meant work, work, and more work. His dad was a workaholic. He had two jobs most of the time. He had one job during the day and the other at night, but sometimes he worked on weekends too. The man had more energy than any person alive. When he wasn't working on weekends at his third job, he worked at home, and that was why David hated summer vacation. His dad was always building something or tearing something down. If he wasn't tearing down a wall or adding a new room to the house, he was putting in a new driveway or garage. It was living hell for a 13-year-old kid. While all of David's friends were off playing baseball or riding their bicycles, he was usually hauling bricks or mixing cement. That's what he remembers about his childhood. David always knew he was in trouble whenever he heard, Where's David? His dad's voice seemed to carry down the street. That phrase could only mean it was time to get to work. Of course, David learned throughout the years how to make himself disappear at just the right times, but his dad usually found him anyway. But dad, I want to go to the park to play with my friends, David would say. You can waste time with your buddies some other time. It's time to get to work now, his dad would respond. It got so bad that David would intentionally fail classes so he would have to go to summer school. Summer school was for students who didn't do well during the regular school year, but he didn't care. It meant less work. It meant freedom. Every June, my old elementary school has a carnival on its ground. This has been happening since I was a little boy. I used to have so much fun there. It was amazing. It had rides like the Ferris wheel and the flying teacups. The Ferris wheel was this huge wheel that carried two people in a giant circle above the rest of the carnival. I remember the first time I got on it when I was seven years old. I had been begging my mom for months to let me ride it. Please, mom, please. I'm big enough now, I would scream. However, she kept saying, 
You're too young, Billy. Maybe one day. Of course, seven-year-old kids have short memories. I kept asking over and over again until she finally said okay, but she said she was going with me. I'm a big boy, Mom. I can go alone, I said. She would not agree. We're going together or not at all, she said. And of course, I said, okay. When the big day came, I was so excited. I almost had an accident while waiting in line. The guy who was seating people kept saying, next, as more and more people got on and the line kept shrinking. His shouts of next kept getting louder and louder and I knew my time was coming up. When we finally reached the end of the line, it felt like I waited a month. We got on and put on our seatbelts. I was excited and afraid at the same time. Then it started. I went so high up in the air that I got dizzy. My stomach began to turn and I felt like throwing up. It was just too fast and too high for me. I didn't get sick, but I was sure glad I was on the ground again when I told my mom, please don't send me up there again, mom. Going to an all-boy high school was no fun. Joe's parents thought it would be a good idea to send him there instead of a public school because he would get distracted by girls, as his mom would say. Once during his third year, Joe begged his mom to let him go to public school. I just want to be normal, he would tell her. I want to meet girls. I don't want to be weird. But his words always fell on deaf ears. Mom always said, that Joe had plenty of time to go on dates after high school and that he needed to concentrate on his schoolwork. This usually made him very sad, but like a good kid, Joe just nodded his head and went on with his studies. That all changed one day when Joe met Carmen, who lived just two blocks away from him. One day, he ran into her at the market by chance. They had gone to kindergarten together. They were also of the same age. She was in Joe's class, and she remembered Joe, too. After about two weeks, they were going steady. Joe was so happy, but had to hide his relationship from his parents, which was okay, because Carmen was hiding him from her family, too. Are you kidding me? Carmen said. They would kill me if they knew I had a boyfriend. <clears throat> Everything was going great for a time, but Joe's mom was right. His grades started slipping, and he soon was on academic probation because he was spending too much of his free time with Carmen. She also dropped a grade or two. As a result, both of them had to go to summer school to improve their grades, but Joe didn't care. He was in love, and that was all that mattered at the time. Much later, he came to realize his mom was right. One hot summer day, Jay and his friends were playing outside. The sun shined down on Jay and his friends as they kicked a soccer ball back and forth. Soccer was Jay's favorite sport to play. Almost every day, Jay would invite his friends from his neighborhood to come out and play soccer in the street. Jay dreamed of one day 
being a professional soccer player. He imagined shooting a goal and hearing the roar of thousands of people as they cheered his name throughout the soccer stadium. Jay knew it would require a lot of practice if he wished to make his dream a reality. One day, as the sun was beaming down on the street where Jay and his friends played earlier, an ice cream truck approached. As soon as Jay heard the ice cream truck's music playing, he ran outside his house with two dollars in his hand. Jay looked around to see where the ice cream truck was. As soon as he spotted it down the street, he bolted towards it. Jay's friends had arrived first and were already asking the ice cream man for a cone of their favorite flavor of ice cream. This gave Jay time to think about what flavor to get. Should I get chocolate or vanilla? Jay asked himself. What's it going to be, son? The ice cream man asked Jay when he noticed he was the last kid standing without an ice cream cone. I'll have pistachio, please, Jay responded after some hesitation. This summer had turned out to be the best so far for Jay. Tomorrow, he would play soccer once more, and if the ice cream truck came around, he would ask his parents for another two dollars. Jay was not looking forward to starting his school year in two weeks. One day, Abel opened his refrigerator and gasped when he noticed there wasn't anything in there. Who ate all the food? Abel asked his brother Mel, who was in the living room sitting down on the couch watching cartoons. You probably woke up in the middle of the night and ate it all, Mel humorously responded. Abel was not amused. His stomach was growling, and he had no time for Mel's childish quips. I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse, Abel proclaimed. I bet you can easily eat too, Mel jokingly said. You are so funny, Abel sarcastically replied. Abel thought of ordering a pepperoni pizza by phone, but soon realized he had only five dollars. He needed ten dollars to make the purchase. He was short by five dollars. Abel asked his brother if he could pitch in for the rest, but he had no cash. Are you even hungry? Abel asked Mel. I already ate, Mel said. This made Abel jealous and a bit angry. What did you eat? Abel inquired with furrowed brows. A ten dollar pizza, Mel casually replied. You must be kidding, Abel said, almost yelling. Mel just sat there watching a recording of an episode from The Simpsons. When is mom coming back? Abel asked Mel. I don't know, he replied. Abel could now only hope that his mom would come to the rescue and bring a large, fresh pizza from Pizza Mountain. Abel plopped down next to Mel on the couch and started watching television with him. They both laughed out loud at the cartoon's funny characters. Abel was enjoying himself so much that he had forgotten that he was hungry. Then commercials began playing. Abel's stomach started calling for food again. I'm going to starve to death, Abel said as the front door to his house started opening. I'm back, and I brought pizza, Abel's mom said as she came in through the door. Abel could not wait to get his hands on the pizza. Joel's school semester was ending soon, 
but he still had not found a job to keep him busy over the summer vacation. This wasn't the only reason Joel wanted a job. He had been taking the bus to school for over a year already. He was ready to start driving to school. All of his friends had been driving since the age of 18, and Joel felt like he was left behind. He had calculated the math and figured it would take him two months of working for him to be able to afford a used vehicle, or one month if he worked full time. Joel had it all planned out. The only problem was finding steady employment. Joel felt like he had applied everywhere possible. He had walked into several fast food restaurants. He had stepped in countless coffee shops. He had visited various retail stores and supermarkets. Joel went around shaking the hands of managers, introducing himself as a college student who is interested in working. Joel mingled with employees and talked to frequent customers in hopes of getting some recognition or even a piece of advice. After submitting application after application, it seemed like he would never get hired. Joel felt like giving up hope. But then, one afternoon, Joel received a call for an interview. Joel jumped for joy when he discovered the interview was for a job working at a bookstore. Joel was so determined to get the job that he was hired right after his interview. He had greatly impressed the manager, who felt he was the perfect candidate for the job. Everything was going according to his plan. Soon, he had enough money saved up to buy the car he had dreamed of. Riding the bus is as easy as pie. The bus driver is there to answer any questions passengers may have. And it only costs one dollar and fifty cents. These were the things Valerie had heard from all her friends about public transportation. She had never ridden on the bus alone before. This was about to change in 15 minutes as she stood waiting at the bus stop at the corner of Atlantic Avenue and 61st Street. Valerie had just turned 15 and was ready to start riding the bus on her own. Valerie's mom had sent her to Grandma's house for a weekend stay. She had packed all her belongings in a backpack and was dressed in her lucky outfit in case she crossed any black cats. She was heading to the city of Montebello, where her grandmother lived. Her heart began racing when she saw the number 260 bus approaching in the distance. She looked around to see if she was alone, but there wasn't anyone else waiting for the bus. She was all alone. Come on, you can do this, Valerie said to herself. She remembered she and her mother had taken the same bus to her grandma's house dozens of times. It's just like before, except mom is not here, Valerie said, trying to ease herself. The bus finally came to a halt at its stop, and its doors open in front of Valerie. She took a deep breath, looked at the bus driver, and stepped inside. Valerie put the money into the slot and greeted the bus driver. She then proceeded to the back of the bus and quickly sat down next to an elderly woman. The scariest part was over. Now all I have to do is sit and wait until I reach my destination, said Valerie to herself. Don't forget to pull the cord, 
a familiar voice said in her head. Monday was the day of the big test. Luella had three days left to study. She knew she had to study for at least three hours per day in the next couple of days if she hoped to get the grade she wanted. Luella needed to score at least a 90% on her test in order to pass her algebra class with an A. The stakes were high for Luella. She had attended every lecture this semester. She had jotted down notes upon notes to take home and study. She had even sat in a few tutoring sessions after class. After turning in all her homework and passing all her quizzes, Luella still felt like she could fail her final test. After all, it was cumulative, meaning the test would test her on everything she had learned. Luella knew what she had to do. It was time to buckle down and study like there was no tomorrow. Motivated and determined, Luella sat at her desk and studied for at least three hours for the next three days. By the time the night before the test came, Luella felt confident that she would do well. Luella woke up that Monday morning with a grin on her face. She had dreamed of taking the test. In the dream, she passed her test with an A. It was up to Luella to make her dream come true that Monday morning. Luella was assured she would. She knew all that studying was about to pay off as she walked into her classroom and sat down at her desk. Nothing can go wrong, Luella said to herself. She was right. Luella not only breezed through all the math problems, but was the first person to finish in her class. Luella knew she could do it. It was of no surprise when she discovered the grade she received. It was an A+. Plus. Jenny had always wanted a pet of her own. She wanted something to take care of, someone to be there whenever she came back home, and most of all, an animal to be best friends with. Jenny would constantly ask her dad to buy her a pet, but her dad always refused. Jenny's dad knew having a pet was a big responsibility. He did not think Jenny was ready to own a pet at 10 years old, and that was exactly what he told her when she asked for one. When will I be ready? Jenny asked one day. Wait until you're 12, Jenny's dad replied. This was good news for Jenny. All she had to do now was to be patient. Two years had passed. Jenny had been counting down the days on her calendar. The morning of her 12th birthday, Jenny jumped on her dad's bed and immediately reminded him of what he had said two years ago. Have you decided on what pet to get? Jenny's dad asked. Jenny could not respond. She had not made up her mind on what kind of pet she wanted. Let me think about it, she said, and ran to her room. Jenny took into consideration all the pets she could imagine. She imagined a white fluffy cat that she'd name Tabby, or a large bright golden retriever that she'd name Yellow and play frisbee with in the afternoons. She imagined owning colorful macaw that she'd name Polly 
and have conversations with whenever she felt lonely. After an hour of weighing in the options, Jenny had made up her mind. Jenny's dad was surprised when he found out what pet his daughter had chosen. I want a horse, she declared when she walked back into her dad's bedroom. How about something a little less expensive, he said to Jenny. A pony, she cleverly replied. Let's go to the pet shop, Jenny's dad said. It was four o'clock when Jenny and her dad arrived at the pet shop on Slauson Avenue. The name of the pet shop was Pet Wonders. Jenny couldn't contain her excitement and yipped as she and her dad exited the car. Jenny's dad smiled at the sight of her thrilled daughter. He remembered his own first pet. It was a chihuahua named Taco. He wondered if Pet Wonders was selling any chihuahuas. Jenny and her dad were greeted by a short and balding man who smelled like dog food. Hello, how can I help you guys today? The man said. We're here to buy a pony, Jenny exclaimed to the man. Actually, we're here to browse, Jenny's dad said right after. Let me know when you're ready to make a purchase, the man replied. Jenny and her dad proceeded to look through the aisles. What do you think of these, Jenny asked her dad. They're too small, she said. Jenny saw a variety of colorful fishes. What about these, Jenny? her dad asked. They're too slimy, said Jenny. Jenny came across snakes and turtles. Would you like one of these? asked her dad. I don't think so, Jenny responded. One hour passed, and Jenny still had not made up her mind on which animal to choose. Jenny and her dad finally got around to see the cats and dogs. It's either one or the other, Jenny's dad said, pointing to the cats and dogs. Jenny had to think long and hard on which pet to get. After what seemed like an eternity, Jenny looked up at her dad and said, I can't choose one. Her dad paused for a minute, smiled, and said to her, Then choose two. Jenny went home with a white cat and a black dog, which were the best birthday presents she had ever received. Surfing was Jeffrey's favorite pastime. Every weekend, Jeffrey and his best friend, Chad, would head to Santa Monica Beach, where they would surf big waves. California was the perfect place to live if you were a surfer. The sunny sky and nice temperature made it an ideal place for surfing. Best of all, California mostly maintains this kind of nice weather throughout the year. Jeffrey and Chad were grateful to be surfers in California and not in Iceland. While their other friends were skateboarding and rollerblading, Jeffrey and Chad were at the beach surfing the day away. Jeffrey was 15 years old when he first learned how to surf. Chad was two years younger when he started learning. They both had met at a surfing competition. Jeffrey was 18 and Chad 16 at the time of the competition. Despite being rivals at first, Jeffrey and Chad soon became buddies after the competition. Now 21 and 19, 
Jeffrey and Chad had become the best surfers on the West Coast. Their medals and trophies were proof of this. There wasn't anything more satisfying in the world than surfing the waters as the sun beamed from above and the wind blew by. Surfing was an exhilarating and incredible experience. It was also a great stress reliever. Jeffrey and Chad felt as if they were on top of the world when surfing. Nothing else mattered when you were in the midst of a barrel ride. Jeffrey and Chad knew that surfing for them would be a lifelong passion. The beach was a great place to be at. This was especially true in the summer when pretty girls would gather on the weekends, bonfires would line the shores at night, and vendors and artists would attract visitors to purchase their wares. There was never a dull moment while at the beach. But if it wasn't for the waters, Jeffrey and Chad would have no reason to go to the beach. There once was a little living doll. She lived inside a doll house that was placed in the corner of a little girl's room. The doll's name was Jane and the little girl's was Diana. Diana and Jane were best friends. No one else knows that Jane can talk and breathe like anyone else. It was a secret between Jane and Diana. Jane and Diana would play together every day. Sometimes they would play within the dollhouse. They liked watching movies, playing hide and seek, and painting. They also liked playing outside with toy cars and drawing with chalk on the ground. Since Diana was far too big and Jane far too small, they could not play hide and seek and run over long distances. Instead, they enjoyed playing their own version of hide-and-seek. When they played, it would have to be inside a small room. Jane was always the one to hide, since it was easy for her to do so. One day, it was Diana's birthday, and she had several of classmates from school come over to celebrate. Jane stayed hidden from plain sight in Diana's room. At one point, things became rowdy among some of the boys and girls, and they began to chase each other around the house. Then a few of them entered Diana's room and began invading her things. One of the boys got a hold of Jane who was in her dollhouse and started to toss and play catch with her among the boys. Then Diana came into the room and took notice of what was happening to Jane and immediately yelled for them to stop. They put Jane back down. Jane was so frightened but relieved to be saved. Get out, Diana screamed. After everybody left, Diana lifted up Jane and asked her if she was okay. Diana was happy to see that Jane was in one piece. It would be the last time that Diana would bring anyone over to play. This secret was too great to risk its discovery. Nobody could ever know of Jane the Living Doll. Amisa was a single mother who worked from home tutoring students. She liked this job because it allowed her to stay home with her own little daughter, Nimisha. Amisa saw all her clients at her kitchen table. 
She picked the kitchen table because from there she could watch her daughter, who usually stayed in the living room. Namisha usually stayed in the living room when her mother was working with another student. One afternoon, though, Namisha felt so thirsty, she had to get into the kitchen to get a drink. Mom, can I please have a drink? Namisha asked. Amisa was annoyed. She was in the middle of a lesson. Yes, but you have to serve yourself because I'm working, Amisa said. Namisha pulled a step stool up to the kitchen cabinet and stood on it. She opened the kitchen cabinet and reached up to the top shelf to get a blue plastic cup. Then she slipped. Namisha let out a huge scream. When Amisa got up to see what was wrong, she saw that her daughter's hand had slipped and the tongs of a large serving fork had gone through Namisha's finger. Namisha was crying. Amisa was scared. She had her client go home early and was going to rush her daughter to the hospital. She didn't want to try and pull the fork out herself because she was worried that she might make the situation worse. Namisha lived four blocks from the hospital. She felt it was faster to walk to the hospital than call and wait for an ambulance. There was only one problem. It was very cold outside, and Amisa couldn't put a coat on her daughter when she had a huge serving fork protruding from one of her fingers. Amisa wrapped a blanket around her child, and together they quickly walked to the hospital. My daughter has a fork stuck in her finger, Amisa yelled as she entered the emergency room.